Well, Max, I think Valentin came to NOAA the first time, what was it, 2013 or something like in London, yeah. uh, Billingsgate. Now we are here. You together started the company and there was like this strange stumbling block the German regulator put in. They were limiting the number of accounts because of, yeah, people using the platform for other objectives. And then you cleaned up last year, right? And now there's a big news. You want to go into the details because I think that's, as an investor, probably the most important update if you compare the neobanks, right? Germany is the largest market, but probably not the easiest one, um, considering the many yeah. different local players. But um, I think with hard work and discipline, you got there, right? Well, th thank you. First, first of all, I'm always happy to be back. I think it's also for me, I think the fifth or sixth time, like speaking at NOAA, to send us on N26, we are a mobile first bank headquartered in Berlin. And the vision has always been to provide a pan-European bank. So we're the only ones that based on one IT platform and one banking license that onboards customers all over Europe. Um, obviously, a highly regulated environment. We had been challenged in the last couple of years. Um, regulators imposed the gross cap on us, um, 60,000 KYCs per month, um, which is obviously like a very... Uh, 60,000, how many customers you have now? Like um, we have like four, four or five uh, million. I think last time we announced this four. Um, and it's obviously like very impactful. Like if you're a gross company <laughs> that just raised a gross equity round with gross investors, um, obviously gross is um, like your most important KPI and will continue to be the most uh, important KPIs. And uh, you know, in the last two years, we have tremendously focused on compliance, scalability, security of our platforms. And we have been in front of the wave, I think for the last 12 months, and this has now been acknowledged by the regulator. Uh, why is growth important for us? We have an extremely scalable platform. So contrary to traditional banks, um, it doesn't matter if you sign up 50 customers tomorrow or 50,000 uh, customers tomorrow. So very scalable platform. And contrary to other business models, you know, in finance, you have to do everything at the beginning, you know, getting the bank license, reporting to the regulator, compliance, KYC modules, EML, and all the other things. And if you build your systems right, you can scale this to as many customers as you want that obviously benefit from extreme economies of scale. Mm. Well, I remember that traditional banks have like a contribution amount from customers, like 1,400 or so per year. And when the neobanks came in, you kind of decreased the economics, obviously signed a lot yeah. of customers. There was this primary account versus a secondary account. Can you receive salaries into the neobank? Is an IBAN? And I think you as an industry went through all these hoops and loops. But when you say it's scalable, do you have positive contribution margins per customers? Yeah. Are the customers, the banking customers, buying enough product to provide for you long-term positive unit economics? Yeah, it's, um, I actually talked to someone from a, from a big traditional German bank the other day, and they said they're also big in corporate banking, big in investment banking, and they said, like, with the private customers, they're actually not earning any money despite, you know, charging, uh, um, like, per order of magnitudes, higher fees than we are doing. So if you, and that's also coming to scalability, if you want to understand the N26 business model, and the same goes um, for other challenger banks, you need to look at the cost base first. So much lower IT cost, no legacy um, IT systems. We acquire customers through virality of the product. We acquire customers because um, the majority of the new customers, they have been exposed to the product by their friends, by their colleagues. And so we are obsessed by the product. Every investment we do in the product is like an investment in customer acquisition. Obviously, lower overhead cost. Um, we have 1,500 people on the team. If we have, instead of 4 million cu uh, customers, like 10 million, 20, 30 million customers, we don't need more um, people on the team. So yes, we can make, we charge lower fees, and um, we have a contribution margin of like 70, 75% of every euro in revenues we're making. Anne Boyden from Starling Bank, and then we obviously had Nikolai from Revolut, we had uh, Monzo one year. All of the European peers 
have broken into EBITDA profitability, mm -hmm. right? But they also didn't have this mysterious customer cap. I can only imagine as a German that the Germans are dodgier than the other Europeans and there's more fraud in Germany. But why is that? Or has the German regulator been stricter? Or why was there more fraud? Or is there not more fraud? It's just the prejudice I have. And in fact, everyone has the same problem. Just the Germans after Wirecard have been a bit more nervous around it, or? Yeah, there's a lot of answers. Like one, I think the rules, the same rules apply for everyone and should apply for everyone. So traditional banks and um, neo banks. Um, second, it is always dangerous to embarrass a regulator. So I read uh, what happened in the US, like SEC, um, a couple of months ago I read that they are having uh, 135 individual lawsuits against 135 individual crypto companies after um, they got embarrassed by FTX. I think the same what happened in Germany um, after Wirecard. They just have increased the bar for everyone. And it's also like N26, you know, um, it, it depends. Uh, like they have a risk-based approach. And so if you're like have 50,000 customers, no, the regulators don't really care about you. Like if you have, if you're the fastest growing bank in Germany, you fall in a different bucket. And for every bucket, um, the bar has been raised. Actually, the, the fraud, it's quite individual. It is lower in Germany than it is in most other markets, but we are onboarding customers in France, in the Eastern European uh, markets, and so on. What is interesting, as you can imagine, like the function of fraud, or money laundering on a platform, is predominantly a function of new customers. And obviously, like, you know, if you're a new bank, you're growing much more than traditional banks. Someone that has been 20 years on your platform, or 10, right. or even five so years the, on a platform. The problem its way yeah. with age, basically. Yeah, it's like, it's also for us, you know, after three, four years, you know, you don't see any in the cohorts you onboarded four years ago. You have offboarded every fraudster, everyone in the category that commits any categories of fin crime. So the more new customers you're having, the, the more fraud or money laundering you see right. on the platform. I have two questions left. One of them is more about you and how you navigate through this yeah, crazy German public world. I mean, there's one article coming out after the other, and other German unicorn founders also. In fact, I also had some coverage like eight years ago or nine years ago. I mean, is it still fun running one of the most debated company in Germany and everyone tries to yeah, make it even harder for you as a team? Yeah, like it's, uh, it is a lot of fun and one, one need to acknowledge um, like from the beginning the coverage of N26 in the media like was always disproportional to the significance of this company. Like I remember when we launched in 2015, after six months I read like mentioning in media like in Germany and like number one was like um, that was 2015, like Deutsche Bank with negative connotation mainly, then it was Postbank, <laughs> then it was N26 with 50,000 customers, followed by uh, Sparkasse with 55 million customers, followed by NG, and it hasn't changed. Like internationally, there's a lot of interest in the story, which is a positive thing because most of the articles like, are, are positive. You know, the worst thing is you found a startup, B2C uh, space, and then no one cares about it. So generally, you want people writing um, about your company, because again, we cannot invest like hundreds of millions of euros because we have lower resources than traditional banks. So we have to impress by the product and we need people talking about the product. Is it still fun? Yes, it's like, it has been by far the most meaningful thing I've done, you know, working in a startup, founding your own startup in literally every category I talk about. It's not only fun, but it's about the steepness of the learning curve, you know, learning new stuff every day. It's about the impact you can have on people's life. It's about the satisfaction when you can make your vision become a reality. So every day is different and every day yeah. excited to get to work. And the industry, I mean, I think there was always the benefit of the doubt the investors had, but cynical bankers, and I'm one of them maybe, we were like questioning, will this sector, the fintech sector, after you raised as much as the global SaaS sector, which is fascinating because software is horizontal and fintech is a vertical. So there was so much money going in. And it seems to me that the larger players, the one who raised the most, who have the largest, as you say, platforms in order to get <coughs> the scalable unit economics, they're making it, right? So I guess fintech, other than scooters or some other 
funny sectors, uh, fintech, fortunately, I guess because it has this high regulator, regulatory entry barriers, once you made it, you're basically fine, right? It's a bit yeah, all the, um, when we started in 26 and 2013, I believed, and I still believe that this is true today, that financial services is the area most ready for disruption. Yeah. It's an area yes. of tremendous opportunity because it has everything, you know, like there's a lot of change in user behavior, change also like in regulation. Every change is like an opportunity for like new players, um, new technologies. It's true, there was a lot of money going into the space. First, like when you do it as long as I do it, you see the pendulum swinging one or the other way many times. Um, I think right now it's like, it's, it's, it's a good place to be in tremendous opportunity and obviously like you know it is healthy that only strong business models like get funding which i think is the case right now but yes. i think we will see like major transitions in the next decades also in the financial service space there's like transitions that have already happened in so many other sectors and i think there will be like global winners and like in all the verticals of the financial services i think we will see new players being successful and also in the future new players emerging we have, we have to stop, but okay, one last question. Crypto, in Switzerland you announced back then that you're doing stuff in crypto together uh, with the Austrian uh, platform. Bitpanda, yeah. pa Bitpanda, exactly. How much is crypto now in percent of your revenues? Are you, are you bullish about crypto or is crypto going to be disrupted soon by something else? It is, it is not too big for us, you know, it is, it is an asset category. We like launched it, be close to our customers. It's, we believe that the one way to a certain level of wealth for most of our customers is building up a well-diversified like, portfolio of, of assets and crypto being oh. one of these assets. I think it's, 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 it's like here to stay, um, but it's not, like, it's not a category we are like heavily investing in. It's not in. strategic for you. Yes. Okay. Well, you're very strategic to me as a friend and a great speaker, and I'm really glad for you to come back. Thank you so much, Max. And Thanks hi for to Valentin. Me. And show us that the Baffin lift was yeah. the main reason you are not at 10 billion customers yeah. now. So thank you. <laughs>